Thank you for coming. Um, we're very lucky today to have Dr. Mark Raymond talk to us. And so I'm gonna keep this short and sweet so we can just hear everything he has to say. So he got his undergraduate degree at Princeton University and his PhD from the Joint Institute for Laboratory Astrophysics in Boulder, Colorado. After that, he went to JPL in 1986 where he has dedicated his life to space science and space exploration. Um, he did so well there that they gave him two of the top awards at JPL, um, the Exceptional Excellence um, in, sorry, the Exceptional Technical Excellence Award <laughs> um, and the Exceptional Leadership Award. And I think he even has an asteroid named after him. I don't know, I'm gonna ask about this at dinner. So <laughs> um, now he's gonna talk to us about the Dawn mission. So without further ado, let's just give him a very warm welcome and hear what he has to say. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate your coming. I'm glad there's nobody sitting in front because I have highly infectious diseases and you <laughs> wouldn't want to be exposed to them. But if you did want to get closer, feel free to. So I'm going to tell you about Dawn. And as you know, I work at JPL, which is run by Caltech for NASA. But there are many organizations around the country and indeed around the world involved in this project. Now, before I start telling you about Dawn, <laughs> I want to give you a little bit of background. So I want to give you a little bit of background of what astronomers knew about the solar system a couple of hundred years ago. So here's a sort of conventional view of the solar system, looking down on it with the sun in the center, the orbits of the inner planets. Here's Earth, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, and Uranus. <laughs> and this is what astronomers knew about the contents of the solar system in 1800 apart from an occasional comet and some moons. And in fact, this was a pretty modern view of the solar system because Uranus had only been discovered in 1781. So this same picture could not have been drawn 20 years earlier. So this was a modern scientific view. Of course, the planets from Mercury to Saturn were known even, of course, to ancient astronomers. Well, then along came these two fellows, Giuseppe Piazzi and Heinrich Wilhelm Olbers, who at the beginning of the 19th century discovered new bodies. In 1801, Piazzi discovered one, and the one I want to tell you about, uh, Olbers discovered in 1807. These were new additions to the solar system family orbiting the sun between Mars and Jupiter. And I'm going to show you high resolution photographs of the objects these fellows discovered. They're here. This is Ceres the Roman goddess of agriculture and grain, and Vesta, the goddess of hearth, home, and family. Ceres uh, is often depicted with her harvest bounty and her crown of grains, and this artist has chosen to depict her with a scythe, but different artists use different farm implements. That's an artistic <laughs> choice. Uh, and in fact, if you had cereal this morning, then you have at least an etymological connection with the good goddess and Vesta, the goddess of hearth, home, and family. It's interesting, not much is known about Vesta because she was worshiped privately in the home. And so there are relatively few surviving records of how she fit into Roman mythology. Uh, but she's, she's rarely depicted in art. But when she is, she always has this very stern look on her face. And one of the things I hope to convince you of today is that the solar system body, Vesta, is a much happier place. So these are what Piazzi discovered in 1801 and Hol Olbers discovered in 1807. And now here's the, the same chart but zoomed in. So Jupiter is the outermost planet. And you can see Vesta and Ceres both fit very nicely into this gap between Mars and Jupiter. And for two generations were known as planets. And in fact, if you had come to one of the KISS lectures, and I don't know how many of you did, but if you'd come to one of the KISS lectures 200 years ago, there would have been two important differences about you. One is you wouldn't have been able to check your email during the presentation. But the other is you would have learned in school that these bodies were planets because that's how they were described then. That was the nomenclature. But of course, scientific knowledge advances and our vocabulary has to change to keep up with that. And indeed, around the middle of the 19th century, more and more and more bodies started to be discovered in this part of the solar system. Until now, it's starting to look something more like this. And 
I will encourage those of you who are sitting at least relatively close to the screen or for later on the people viewing it on the, um, on the web to confirm for those who are farther away that I've added 10,320 <laughs> individual dots to this chart to show you the locations of that number of asteroids today. Now, we know about many, many, many more asteroids than that. I'm only showing you the ones that are larger than about 10 kilometers or five miles in diameter. And if I showed you all the ones that we knew about, this would be nothing but a solid yellowish green mass here. But the point of the chart is to show that this part of the solar system, which we now call the main asteroid belt, is very different from the rest of the solar system. The inner solar system is largely devoid of these bodies, and if we zoom out, you can see even more clearly that there's something special about this part of the solar system that distinguishes it from the rest of the solar system. And Dawn's mission is to go study the two largest objects between Mars and Jupiter, Vesta and Ceres. And if we have time afterwards, question and answer, that sort of thing, I can give you more of an idea about why, these, why the, the asteroid belt is believed to be the way it is. But I think when most people think of asteroids, they think of chunks of rock, right? The size of buildings or mountains. But Vesta and Ceres are not like that. And so here we can compare Vesta, as photographed by Dawn, with other objects from the main asteroid belt that had been visited by, pri by spacecraft prior to the Dawn mission. And some of them are so small that you'll just have to take my word for it that inside the box here is, are these small asteroids. And in fact, when we bring in Ceres, you can see even more clearly these objects are not at all of the scale of typical asteroids. And indeed, geologists, planetary geologists, generally no longer even call Vesta and Ceres asteroids. So let's take another look at their size. So here's Vesta, the smaller of the two, with an equatorial diameter of 350 miles. And Ceres has an equatorial diameter of nearly 600 miles. These are big places. And so we can compare them with the two largest regular asteroids that spacecraft had been to prior to dawn. Matilda is the largest asteroid a United States spacecraft had visited. And in the interest of full disclosure, I feel obligated to tell you I exaggerated its size here. I had to make it a pixel so that you could see it. And Lutetia, somewhat larger, was visited by the European Space Agency's Rosetta spacecraft in 2010. So you can see Vesta and Ceres, again, are much larger. So we can compare them with other solar system objects that you're more familiar with to give you a better sense of the scale. And I'm sure many of you, maybe everybody, remembers in 2006 when the International Astronomical Union created a new category of solar system bodies. And Pluto was put into the category of dwarf planets. And oh my goodness, everybody thought this was so awful. I mean, how could Earth be such an interplanetary bully? And why didn't we include Pluto's feelings in the matter? How could we be so inconsiderate? Well, whatever you think of that decision, whatever you happen to think of it, turns out Pluto is the second object discovered to fit in the category of dwarf planets. Ceres, which was discovered 129 years earlier, is the first. Ceres satisfies all of the attributes of a dwarf planet that Pluto does. And uh, so, as I said earlier, as scientific knowledge advances, vocabulary changes. You may like it, you may not like it, but vocabulary changes. And so Ceres is in the same category of dwarf planets. But to me, the real message of a chart like this is that these are not just chunks of rock. These are big places, they're worlds. And to me, one of the things that's so cool about a mission like Dawn is we're not just going out visiting chunks of rock. We're exploring some of the largest uncharted worlds in the inner solar system. And I think that is really cool. In fact, not some of, but truly the largest uncharted worlds. In fact, prior to dawn, Ceres was the largest object between the sun and Pluto that a spacecraft had not yet visited. I think that's really cool. But a chart like this is deceptive as well, because California is flat, right? But these are round, three-dimensional objects. And in fact, Vesta has more than twice the surface area of California. So if we go into the third dimension, 
we can compare a map of Ceres uh, made with dawn images with that of the United States to the same scale. And sure, Ceres isn't as big as the United States, Ceres isn't as big as Earth, but it's still a big place. It's got 37% of the area of the continental United States. And if you just think about how vast and varied and frankly beautiful the geography and topography and geology of our country are, it suggests that in a place this big, there's an opportunity for a lot of diversity, a lot of different things to see. I should also point out, just again, full disclosure, obviously these are not the colors of the country that you would see with your naked eye. Similarly, these are not as well. As many of you know, scientists often encode some other information with the color, which doesn't matter here, but I just didn't want you to think that this was the actual color. So let's take a look at Ceres again with some exaggerated color as viewed by dawn. So these are based on images that we've just taken in recent times. And in addition to the craters, you can see a lot of linear features here and quite a number of bright areas like that one. And when you just see this, to me, this, this kind of picture is really mesmerizing. I mean, it looks like here this alien world is just casting its, you know, a beacon out into the cosmos, just inviting an interplanetary traveler to come in for a closer look. And when we started getting pictures like this, one of the first things that people asked is, could these be the lights of an alien city? And you know what? I find questions like that really distressing. It just makes you wonder about the state of critical thinking. Not a problem that afflicts people who come to lectures like this, but you just have to wonder about people that ask questions like that. I mean, here we take some of the best of humankind to build a complex interplanetary probe, send it to a distant dwarf planet, and as it gets there, people are asking if this could be lights of an alien city. I mean, how could we possibly know whether the Syrians live in cities, right? <laughs> they might live in large states. They could live in rural communities. They may live underground and not let their light leak out into space. So how could we possibly know something like that? It really, really is just disturbing that people would ask this kind of question. But mostly, this kind of picture makes you want to fly in closer and get a closer look, and that's exactly what we did. And I'll show you another view of it here. So this is a 57-mile diameter crater here that's a couple of miles deep. And you can see these tremendously bright areas. And I'll tell you in a moment what formed them, but first let's zoom in. And you can see that in the center there, I don't know how well you can see it, but here's a pit that's, oh, about five or six miles across with a dome in the center that's uh, a couple thousand feet high and hills or even mountains here that are several thousand feet high and obviously a, or a complicated network of fissures and cracks in the surface. So quite an intriguing structure. And again, you saw there were some others off to the side. And I'm going to show you an animation of Ceres with, based on pictures that Dawn took. And while that's up here, I'll explain to you what the origin of this is. So here's Ceres. Here's the same crater. And because Ceres is named for the goddess of agriculture and grain, all the features on Ceres are named for uh, deities having to do with, uh, with agriculture or festivals. So we now understand that Ceres has subsurface salt water. And the impact that excavated this crater reached down to that salt water. And the salt water eventually, we believe long after the impact occurred, made its way to the surface where it froze in the cold of space and then sublimated, that is transformed from being a solid to a gas, the water molecules dissipated, and left behind the dissolved salts and so what you're seeing are salt flats. And this structure is a 13,000 foot high cryovolcano that instead of spewing what you would call lava or magma, emitted cryomagma, that is cold, 
basically a mixture of rock, salt, and water, mud in essence. And Dawn has continued orbiting Ceres now for more than two years, much of the time, as was as when it took this picture, closer to the surface of Ceres than the International Space Station is to Earth. So as long as there weren't any tall trees, and there weren't, the spacecraft was pretty safe. So that's just a quick view of Vesta, of Ceres, excuse me. Let me show you a quick view of Vesta. So here it is in one of Dawn's images. And when we were approaching, one of the first things we observed was this triplet of craters called the Snowman, for obvious reasons. And Vesta, I told you, is 350 miles in diameter at the equator. But down here is a crater more than 300 miles in diameter. It's a huge fraction of the diameter of Vesta itself, with a mountain that rises to two and a half times the height of Mount Everest on Earth. So your planet doesn't have topography at all like this. And, and I'm going to show you some more in a moment, but I just want to draw your attention to one other thing right now, which is a network of canyons here. And we'll see those again in a second. So I, we took. We've already taken uh, about 90,000 pictures of Ceres, and we took more than 30,000 pictures of Vesta. I wanted to show all of them to you, but Michelle wouldn't allocate me enough time today. So just as with the animation of Ceres, here's an animation of Vesta based on Dawn's images. And one of the first things you notice is the northern hemisphere is much more densely cratered than the southern hemisphere. Why? Because the impact that excavated that big crater at the south, near the South Pole sprayed out so much material it resurfaced the southern hemisphere and erased all of the craters that had been there before. And here you can see these canyons near the equator. There are more than 90 of them, some larger than the Grand Canyon. Those are from the impact at the South Pole that sent its energy into Vesta. Here's part of the crater wall. The energy reverberated inside this huge body and broke up the ground hundreds of miles away from the impact site. So here again is the, <coughs> excuse me, the wall of the crater. And the crater walls rise to three times the height of Mount Everest. Here's the mountain in the center. It's 110 miles across at the base. And I think this is really an extraordinary place. But in the interest of time, let me move on and give you just sort of an overview of the mission. So we started from most people's favorite planet, Earth. We launched in September 2007. And we started out with a big rocket. I just put that in to help you stay awake. <laughs> and on our way out to the asteroid belt, we flew by Mars and robbed Mars of some of its orbital energy around the sun in order to help fling the spacecraft even farther. And being environmentally responsible, JPL believes in the conservation of energy. And so, of course, to speed Dawn up, Mars had to slow down. And so Mars now orbits the sun more slowly than it did prior to Dawn's flyby in February 2009. Mars goes more slowly by a velocity of one inch per 180 million years, for those of you who are keeping track. <laughs> then in July, <coughs> excuse me, July 2011, the spacecraft got to Vesta, went into orbit around there. We spent about 14 months taking pictures and making many other measurements. Then the spacecraft broke out of orbit, flew for another two and a half years to Ceres, and went into orbit around it, where it is now and likely will be essentially forever. And at each destination, we make a comprehensive set of measurements. We fully photograph the surface. I've shown you some photographs. You're seeing some now. We're all visual creatures, right? Everybody loves pictures. You love pictures. We love pictures. So we've taken a lot of pictures. We also take pictures in stereo, that is, at different angles, so we can build up topographical maps, which is how I was able to tell you how deep some of the craters were or how tall that, um, that cryovolcano was. We also map the elemental composition 
That is, what are the atomic constituents of these bodies? If you remember the periodic table of the elements, which of the key elements there, what, what's there and what are their abundances? And we also map the mineralogical composition. That is, how do these atoms come together to form minerals? In other words, what kinds of rocks are there? We measure the gravity field because that tells us about the interior structure of these bodies. How is the mass distributed inside? And for example, one of the things we learned from that is that Vesta, like Earth, has a dense iron nickel core. Vesta is no longer molten, although it was at some time, but a dense core surrounded by a uh, mantle, surrounded by a crust. And so many planetary geologists no longer think of Vesta as an asteroid, but rather it's more closely related to the terrestrial planets, one of which is right underneath our feet. So it's, it's really like a mini planet. And we also searched for moons as the spacecraft approached both bodies. We took uh, extensive, we undertook an extensive photography campaign to look for moons because certainly these bodies are large enough they could have them. Interestingly, we didn't find any. Not sure what that tells us about them, but it must tell us something. However, now I know that Ceres does have a moon. Its name is Dawn. I think that's kind of cool. So this, this chart raises a couple of interesting points. Dawn is actually the only spacecraft ever to orbit an object in the main asteroid belt. It's also the first spacecraft to get to a dwarf planet and the only spacecraft to orbit a dwarf planet. But perhaps more interesting than either of those is in nearly 60 years of space exploration, Dawn is the only spacecraft ever to orbit any two solar system destinations. Which when you think about it is really kind of a surprising thing. Right? That seems like a very obvious mission to undertake. It's not as if nobody ever thought of it before. It happens in science fiction all the time, right? Go to some planet, do whatever you're going to do there, you know, beat somebody up or make out with them, and go to some <laughs> other planet and do the same thing. And it seems like the kind of mission scientists would want to undertake, go someplace, study it in great detail, not just in a brief flyby, but for an extended period of time, and then depart, go elsewhere, and study it. And yet, this had never even been tried prior to the Dawn mission. And the reason is because until recently, engineers were confronted with a problem. They were confronted with the same problem as this fellow. That is, they were just trying to do something that was beyond their technological capability. It turns out a mission to go to a distant solar system destination, go into orbit, maneuver in orbit, then break out of orbit and fly somewhere else in the solar system and go into orbit around it is far, far, far beyond the capability of conventional chemical propulsion. And so a number of years ago, some colleagues and I got together at JPL and asked the question, how can we travel around the solar system more easily and less expensively? And our answer to that was ion propulsion. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, if you're like me, and I can already tell some of you are, the first time you ever even heard of ion propulsion was in science fiction. And I'm sure you recognize the Star Wars TIE fighter that Darth Vader and the evil empire used to fight Luke Skywalker and the members of the Rebel Alliance. And in the Star Wars universe, the TIE fighter, T-I-E, stood for Twin Ion Engine. Because this was one of the most futuristic, coolest, advanced technologies that George Lucas could think of. <coughs> Excuse me. And to me, one of the rewards of working on a project like this is getting to turn that science fiction into science fact. So here's an artist's concept of Dawn using its ion engine just a little more than two years ago as it was maneuvering into orbit around dwarf planet Ceres. That, to me, using an ion engine to go into orbit around a dwarf planet is right out of science fiction. And here's a photograph of an ion engine operating in a vacuum chamber at JPL where I work and some others do here as well. And you can see it really does produce this cool blue glow like in science fiction movies. And the reason for that is because the ion engine uses the propellant xenon, which is like helium or neon, but heavier. And just as neon 
happens to glow orange, like in neon signs, neon lights. Xenon just happens to glow blue. And this engine is 10 times as efficient as conventional engines. So this would be like having your car get 300 miles per gallon. And that's really the key to what allows us to undertake a mission which would be not just difficult, but impossible, truly impossible without ion propulsion. Now, although this is very efficient, we only flow a very small amount of propellant through the engine at a time. And so the thrust is also very weak. In fact, it would take at today's throttle level, that is at the distance dawn is from the sun now, it would take two months to expend just one gallon of propellant. And the thrust is so weak, it's, uh, in fact, I'm gonna do an ion propulsion experiment here for you. This is pretty safe, you can do this yourself at home. And that is, the ion engine pushes on the spacecraft as hard as this single piece of paper pushes on my hand. But in the zero gravity, frictionless conditions of space, gradually the effect of this thrust can build up. So the thrust is 10,000 times less, roughly, than that of conventional planetary spacecraft. At peak throttle level, it's 90 millinewtons, for those of you who know what a millinewton is. And so it would take Dawn four days to accelerate from zero to 60 miles per hour. It doesn't exactly evoke the concept of a drag racer. But instead, of, <laughs> but instead of thrusting for four days, if you thrust for a week, or a month, or a year, or as Dawn now has for nearly six years, you can achieve fantastically high velocity. And so this is what I like to call acceleration with patience. And if you're patient, and I am, I'm a very patient guy, this is a great way to explore the solar system. And Dawn has now changed its own velocity by far, far more than any spacecraft ever has with its own propulsion system. And so this really is the key to what allows us to undertake such an ambitious mission. Now, I told you <coughs> excuse me, that ion propulsion's been around a long time. It was, I mean, George Lucas knew about it in Star Wars in the, in the 1970s. I wanted to give you the entire history of ion propulsion, <laughs> but once again, I wasn't allocated enough time, so I'm just gonna keep the story uh, focused on Dawn, which is shown here in an artist concept. And the first thing you notice is it's dominated by these huge solar arrays. When we launched Dawn in 2007, this was the largest interplanetary spacecraft, wingtip to wingtip, that NASA had ever launched. Why? Because we're going far from the sun, so we need a large area of solar cells to capture that weak sunlight in order to produce enough electrical power to power all systems. And the ion engine is power hungry. It's on a real power trip, you could say. So it takes a lot of electrical energy to, to operate that system. These solar arrays are so large, 65 feet tip to tip. This room from one corner to the other diagonally is a little more than 62 feet. So this spacecraft, if in the room, could not quite fit from one corner to the other. This is a very large spacecraft. It's also greater than the, or about the distance from a pitcher's mound to home plate in a professional baseball field. So here's one of the ion engines here. There's a second ion engine here, and oh boy, what do you know? We have a third ion engine there, so we do the Star Wars TIE Fighters one better. <laughs> this is our main antenna that we use to communicate with Earth. It's five feet in diameter, and we use that for communicating from across the solar system. And uh, that's an artist concept. Let me show you a photograph of the spacecraft when it was being built in a clean room here on Earth. And this is one of the two solar array wings. This is another. And of course, they're folded up because you can't fit a 65 foot wide spacecraft inside the nose cone of a rocket. And so once the rocket took it up high enough that it was above the atmosphere, the nose cone separated. Eventually, it released the spacecraft and the spacecraft opened up these big solar arrays. I think of it as being like a 
big celestial dragonfly extending its wings and taking flight. Here are some of the sensors that we've used for studying Vesta and Ceres. There's a pair of cameras here for those of you who are interested. This is a visible and infrared mapping spectrometer. There's a gamma ray spectrometer and a neutron spectrometer elsewhere on the spacecraft that you can't see here. This is one of the ion engines. This one foot diameter metal grid here has 15,000 little holes in it through which we shoot the xenon ions. We shoot them out at velocities up to 90,000 miles per hour. And because they go out so fast, they give a relatively large push back on the spacecraft. And that's what makes this so efficient. And the xenon is stored inside a tank inside the main structure here. And because I've mentioned xenon a number of times, I thought I ought to show you a photograph of xenon. So this is actually my pet chameleon named xenon. <laughs> and because of his bluish green color, he has sort of a cos cosmetic affection for ion propulsion. And to be perfectly honest, he gets a kick out of being included in my public presentations. So when I go home tonight and tell him a bunch of people at Caltech got to see a picture of him, he's going to think that was really cool. <laughs> so back to the spacecraft. Here's the main spacecraft structure here. This is the five foot diameter antenna. Here are some more of the sensors on top. This is Tom. And this is one of the two solar array wings. At 27 feet, each wing is the width of a singles tennis court. Each wing is wider than this room. I think that's, I think that's pretty amazing. And I don't know about you, but I think spacecraft are neat things to look at. I think they're neat. They're cool, right? I think they're cool. But to me, cooler than what spacecraft look like is what spacecraft do. And so I'd like to spend a few moments talking about what spacecraft do. Because we use spacecraft like this to go far from home. This, of course, is home. And to the accuracy I can do PowerPoint, this is low Earth orbit. It's space but it's not very far away. It's not very far away. In fact, the distance from the surface of Earth to low Earth orbit is comparable to the distance from here to San Diego. And many satellites and the International Space Station, the Space Shuttle when it was flying, and many others inhabit low Earth orbit. It's space, not very far. So let's zoom out and introduce what's called geosynchronous orbit. Now, in geosynchronous orbit, I know many of you know this, but for the rest of us, it's probably worth a reminder. In geosynchronous orbit, a spacecraft takes 24 hours to go around Earth once. But Earth turns in 24 hours. So if the spacecraft goes around in 24 hours and Earth turns in 24 hours, the spacecraft, or the satellite, I should say, is always over the same point on Earth. Or from their perspective on the ground, the satellite's always at the same place in the sky because it's going around at the same rate you are, which is why geosynchronous orbit is a very convenient location for weather satellites that you want to have a fixed view of the ground or communication satellites so you don't want to have to constantly be moving the antenna on Earth or other systems that you want to have in a fixed location from the perspective of our rotating Earth. And at 22,300 miles, Geosynchronous orbit is a long way. That's a long way away. I mean, it's far even compared to the diameter of our planet. That's a long distance. And in the nearly 60 years of sending satellites into space, the overwhelming majority have gone to somewhere between low Earth orbit and geosynchronous orbit. Now, with that context, let me get rid of some of that and put this here. And now I'll bring in the moon and put the moon where it belongs at the same scale. The moon is really far away. The moon is 10 times the distance to geosynchronous orbit. It's 30 times our, dia our planet's diameter. The moon is a quarter of a million miles away. That is a long way. This is a long way away. And you've probably heard you know, legends, stories that people used to believe, I don't know if people do now or not, but long ago, people believed 
that in the 1960s and 1970s, 24 men traveled the distance from the Earth to the Moon. That's what people claim. I don't know if that's really true or not. Um, people don't do that today. People don't do that. People go a little farther than it is from here to San Diego. But at one time, people did. And so what that tells me is this picture shows the scale of the entire range of firsthand, personal, human experience throughout all of human history. All of that human experience is contained in a picture of this scale. And dawn passed the orbit of the moon the day after it launched. So we launched September 27, 2007, and on September 28th had the moon in our rear view mirror. So now let's bring in the next scale, which is Earth's orbit around the sun. And of course, as the Earth goes around the sun, it carries the moon with it. So let's bring the sun into this picture. This is the sun. And to the scale of the sun, this is the orbit of the moon. And this, to, that, to the correct scale, is the size of the Earth. The sun is large compared even to the orbit of the moon. The sun is larger than the entire range of firsthand personal human experience throughout all of human history. <coughs> Excuse me, the sun is 109 times the diameter of Earth. The sun is 865,000 miles in diameter. From this, we can conclude the sun is big. <laughs> Okay, so now with this understanding, let's get rid of some of that stuff, and I'm gonna put the sun down in this corner, and to the same scale, here's the orbit of the Earth. I'm magnifying it briefly. The blue is the orbit of the moon. Earth itself is much, much too small to be seen here. So that blue dot is the orbit of the moon. There's the sun, and dawn was as far away as the sun in February, of, in, sorry, in 2010. And last year, it was four times as far as the sun, more than 1,500 times as far from Earth as the moon is, well in excess of a million times farther than the International Space Station. And this, to me, is really incredible. And corny as it sounds, and that's okay, I know this does sound corny, but it's also true, that on missions I've worked on, including Dawn, when the spacecraft is passed on the far side of the sun, I've actually gone outside and put my thumb up and blocked out the sun and thought, gosh, we have a spacecraft on the far side of the sun. This is the same sun that shone down on our planet for four and a half billion years. And this is the same sun that's the source of virtually all of the energy our planet has ever had and will ever have. This is the same sun that so dominated human thought in art, literature, culture, philosophy, science, mythology and religion, throughout all of human history. And this is the same sun that's a third of a million times the mass of our planet and is the gravitational master of the solar system. This is the same sun that's our signpost in the Milky Way galaxy. And yet we can send spacecraft to the far side of the sun. And when I say we, I don't mean me. I don't mean the Dawn team. I don't mean everybody at JPL. I don't, mean, I don't even mean the entirety of the engineering and science community. I mean, to me, these are missions of humankind. <coughs> Excuse me, and, and to me, everybody can participate in a mission like this. I mean, anybody who's ever looked up at the night sky in wonder, anybody who's ever had any curiosity at all about Earth and its place in the cosmos, Anybody who's ever wondered about you know, the, the nature of nature, anybody who's ever just felt that deep, you know, burning desire for an adventure, you know, the, the longing to go beyond the horizon, to see what's there, to undertake a, a noble quest in search of knowledge, anybody who's ever felt that kind of thing participates in a mission like this. And to me, that's really what's neat about this. Because in my view, Dawn and the other, other interplanetary missions that we conduct truly are missions of humankind.
And that's what I think is most special about missions like this. And that raises the question then, how do we do this? Well, we start by putting the spacecraft on top of a huge bomb and hoping that it doesn't blow up. <laughs> and you know that these launches can often produce quite beautiful explosions. And maybe you see debris raining down on cars, setting things on fire and that sort of thing. And they can be, they can be quite beautiful, but that's not how you want your mission to go. So we launched Dawn from Cape Canaveral. In fact, we launched it at dawn. Here's the sun <laughs> rising in the background. And we had a very pretty launch, but not the bad kind of pretty. And so then here's the, here's, once we got in space, here's the trajectory. Again, with the conventional view, the sun in the center, this is the orbit of Earth. And as we're flying along, when we're mostly thrusting with the ion engine is where it's this nice xenon chameleon blue and where it's dark is where we're coasting. So we launched the spacecraft and started out coasting for a while as we're checking out spacecraft subsystems. And then we did some tests with the ion propulsion system and some other tests. And then we got into a pretty regular routine of thrusting most of the time. Then we had a seven month long coast period during which we flew by Mars and slowed Mars down. And then resumed ion thrusting. As you can see, we're gradually spiraling farther and farther away from the sun until we got to Vesta in 2011 went into orbit around it, accompanied Vesta in its orbit around the sun for almost 14 months. Then we broke out of orbit and undertook this two and a half year flight through further through the main asteroid belt to go into orbit around Ceres. And that's where the spacecraft is now. And in fact, we can zoom in and see that this is where Dawn is today on September 11th, 2017. And that's where Ceres is as well, because on the scale of the solar system, they're at the same place. But we can also zoom in and see where Vesta is today. And that's where it is. And in fact, Dawn is right now, uh, the distance between Dawn and Vesta is nearly three times the distance between the Earth and the Sun, which I think is pretty cool because the spacecraft used to live at Vesta. And I mean, it really shows this is an interplanetary spaceship. Uh, and as long as I've mentioned Earth and the Sun, we can zoom in on Earth and see where Earth is. And oh boy, what do you know? That's actually where we are right now. There's Beckman if you're trying to orient yourself. Now, to me, when you look at a picture like this, it's flat and it's static. And it's easy to forget that everything's in motion. To me, the solar system has this big, beautiful, complex choreography. And so I want to show you an animation of how all this works. But it's going to take us a moment to get ourselves oriented. So we're starting with the alignment of the planets in March 2007. So here, and we launch in September. This is going to give you a few seconds to kind of synchronize before, before you actually see departure from Earth. So here's the sun, blue for the orbit of Earth, red for the orbit of Mars. This is the orbit of Vesta, and this is the orbit of Ceres. And what we'll see is that Vesta is going to go around the sun one full time before dawn even gets there. Ceres is going to go around almost twice. So here we go. September 2007, the spacecraft leaves Earth, fires up the ion engine. It's aiming for a flyby of Mars and ultimately Vesta. Here is the gravity boost from Mars. Lights up the ion engine again. Vesta's here, but it's not going to get there until Vesta's down here. This is Ceres, which has still one full revolution before we'll even get to it. But sure enough, in mid-2011, the spacecraft goes into orbit around Vesta, accompanies it again for 14 months. Then in September 2012, fires up the ion engine. It looks like it's close to Ceres. It actually isn't as close as it looks here. But it's two and a half years and 900 million miles of interplanetary travel to go from Vesta to Ceres. But sure enough, in early 2015, it gets there, goes into orbit around it, and that's where it is now. That's where it will be. So that's just a quick overview of the Dawn mission. Uh, we're very busy. There's lots of things going on all the time. I'm not going to bore you with every imaginable detail. <laughs> Instead, I will just thank you very much for your attention. I appreciate your letting me tell you about the Dawn <laughs> mission. So thank you. I'll also just mention 
Uh, if you're interested in learning more about the Dawn mission, you can go to our website. You paid for this mission, you're a taxpayer. Dawn, D-A-W-N, dot J-P-L dot NASA dot gov. And I have a blog there called the Dawn Journal uh, where I write about the mission, talk about the science, what have we learned, the engineering, the challenges, what's cool, what's exciting, what's difficult, sometimes what's disappointing, um, what's inspiring. Anyway, sometimes what's fun. So I encourage you to take a look.